and we're good to go. All right, hey everyone, welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. My name is Sarah McAnulty. Uh, I am the person who runs Skype a Scientist. And today we are joined, we're so excited to talk about galaxies with uh, Keyshawn Ivory. Uh, Keyshawn, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing all of your knowledge with us. Yeah, of course, thanks for having me. Awesome. So um, do you wanna tell us who you are, what you do and why you like it? Yeah, of course. Uh, so hey everybody. I'm Keyshawn Ivory. I'm currently a master's student in the Fisk Vanderbilt Bridge Program in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so I'm an astrophysics grad student. Um, why I like what I do. So, so I'm gonna obviously talk a lot more about specifically what kind of research I do, um, but I'll start off with just why I kind of like astronomy in general. Um, I got into it when I was a kid, which I don't think is super unusual for, for like this field in particular, because Kids like space, kids like looking up at the sky and wondering what's up there. Um, but that's actually not what I did. I was assigned um, in my English class in like second grade, this like lexicon assignment where we had to look up a bunch of words and write the definitions and the part of speech. And one of the words was astronomy. And I feel like I loosely knew what it meant, but I had to of course look it up and write down the definition word for word. And in the process, I was like, oh, this is actually kind of cool sounding. Folks in the audience, can you see and hear me? Okay. He's frozen. Okay. Let's just give it give it a minute. Um, in the meantime, if you have squid questions, you know what? I'll show you some insects while we're waiting because uh, I have them in the house. So let's let's do that. Um, sorry for technical difficulties. Uh, okay. So we've got two kinds of insects here. We've got a type of praying mantis, which is called a ghost mantis. Hopefully Keyshawn will be back soon and we'll get back to talking about space, but we make the most of it here. Um, give me just a moment to get this little monster out. Come here. All right, here we go. Uh oh. Hmm. There you are. Come here. Come here, sweetest. There we go. All right. So, this is a type of praying mantis. They're called ghost mantises. Um, they're kind of spooky looking. Can you see the face on that little guy? Let's see if I can bring it closer to the camera and maybe put something behind it. This is a bit of a uh, show must go on type moment while we wait for Keyshawn's internet to come back. They eat uh, little fruit flies. So if you've ever had fruit flies in your kitchen or seen them uh, flying around near trash cans or had them in the lab for any um, school projects, that's what these little guys eat. They're pretty easy to keep in captivity. I just have them in a uh, little glass tank that's about the size of a shoebox. Um, this one is pretty young still. It's not fully grown yet. Um, so if you have any questions about that, about insects, about squid, I can answer that in the meantime. I know it's not what you signed up for today, um, but I hope Keyshawn will be back shortly. Let's just give it a minute here. Let's see. Um, how does it become black? That's a great question. 
Um, some animals just sort of are black. I don't know what type of pigment this, this animal uses, but it's not the same as, um, it's a different species from the praying mantis that you might, well, I don't know where you live, but if you live in North America, um, the praying mantis that you might find in your garden, they're usually green, sometimes they're brown. Um, but this one is of course, pretty dark brown. Um, and so it doesn't switch back and forth between being green and blackish brown. It's pretty much always this color. There are some that look like this, like in terms of spikiness that are green. Um, but this particular individual, kind of like if you have a cat or dog, they might be brown, they might be black, they might be white. Um, and they're just kind of always that color. Um, this little animal is um, about two months old. Um, they live to be about a year old, sometimes nine months. Um, and when it gets bigger, it'll pretty much be a bigger version of this. It's like uh, head, thorax, abdomen. Its abdomen is gonna get a little bit bigger. Um, and if it's a female, that abdomen, so that's like this part here, will get a lot bigger because that's where she'll house her eggs if it's a female. I don't know, it's hard to tell at this stage. Can you see how it's kind of like going back and forth and back and forth like that? That's because they're kind of pretending to be like leaves blowing in the wind, like uh, crunchy leaves that you might find on the ground. They don't want bigger animals to see them. And so uh, they will pretend to be uh, leaves so they don't get eaten. Um, let's see. Hello from Brazil. That's really cool. Um, what kind of habitat do they live in? Man, I don't know. I know that they don't live in North America. Um, let's, what's my favorite bug? Oh my God. What a good question. Probably lightning bugs. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia, which is where I live now. Um, and in the summer, I really liked going out at night and seeing all of the lightning bugs, uh, just like in my backyard and catching them. They're really easy to catch, um, or at least the lightning bugs that live here are pretty easy to catch because they're not super fast um, and they're just gorgeous. And I like bioluminescence. Um, when I was getting my PhD, I uh, worked on uh, bioluminescent squid. Um, cool. What kind of large vegetarian insects would make good classroom pets? Let, let me show you one. All right, this critter sometimes takes me a minute to find because it is so good at camouflage. This uh, kind of sad looking bush that I have here is actually um, like a raspberry or blackberry bush. That's what they like to eat. And I found them. This is a leaf insect. They live in the Philippines. They live in uh, lots of other places in Asia as well. Um, but this particular species lives in the Philippines. This one's also not fully grown yet. So this one looks just like a leaf. It's wild. I mean, look at that camouflage. Let me, let me, there we go. I mean, it's unbelievable. They're so impressive. So these little guys um, will eat uh, bramble, uh, AKA, yeah, uh, the leaves from blackberry, raspberry. And in the summertime, you can probably find blackberry and raspberry just like growing wild near you. Um, if you have a blackberry or raspberry plant in your backyard, you can use that as well. Um, or you can do what I do and have uh, a blackberry bush in their tank with them. This is because I got these animals in the winter time and the winter in Philadelphia is pretty cold and not particularly good for growing plants. And so um, I just kept it inside and it worked, worked fine. Um, Divya, your students can log in by using the exact same link that you used. Um, they can go for it. Um, the reason, Samantha, that the ghost mantis is called a ghost mantis is honestly because they're kind of spooky looking and uh, that's just what they decided to name them. There are a lot of animals that are called like ghost and then the animal. There's the, the ghost shrimp and that's called a ghost shrimp because they're see-through. Um, I know there are a bunch of other ghost animals but of course right now I'm blanking on them, but most of them are just like white or, um, or a little bit translucent. And that's why they end up being called the ghost version of what they are. Keyshawn's back. Um, I think in the wild, the ghost mantises would eat things that aren't fruit flies, but that's just the easiest thing for them to uh, 
get when they're here. The, the, the ghost mantises will get about this big, they get like two inches. And this one will get much larger than this. It'll get like that big. Um, I haven't named them. None of these animals bite or sting people. Um, I've caught many lizards, so many lizards in my life. I'm trying to not touch wildlife because um, it's generally better for them if you don't touch them, if you just appreciate them from afar. Uh, but uh, yeah, lightning bugs, I don't mind catching because there's so many of them and I won't hurt them. Hey, Keyshawn. Hey, so they're doing, they've been doing construction around my building because they, but the owner sold the building, so they're like making it something else. So it wouldn't surprise me if they hit some kind of, I don't know, electrical. Some sort of nonsense happening. Yeah. Um, cool. So I've been uh, just doing a bug show for the last uh, couple of minutes, always. Oh, we love that. We love ready that. Ready to launch into that at any time <laughs> of day. So, okay. The last we heard, uh, you were looking up, you had um, a word that you had to look up and, right. um, and we'll just take it from there. So everyone, we're going to switch back from bugs to after <laughs> Uh, in the meantime, I'll answer your questions in the chat while uh, Keyshawn talks. Okay. So the word was, uh, you know, astronomy. And I knew roundabout what it meant, but I don't think that I knew very specifically what it was. So I looked it up and I had to write down the definition word for word. And in the process, I was like, oh, this actually sounds interesting. I think maybe when people ask, what do you want to do for a living? Or what do you want to do when you grow up? This is what I might say, because it seems like the coolest thing that I found so far. And so I was like eight at that time and, you know, time went by and I just kind of never changed my answer when people would ask, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? Um, the astrophysics or because they're both accurate. Uh, but yeah, that's how I got into astronomy very generally. Um, so now getting more into, I guess, what I specifically do. So I, I, I titled this grouping galaxies in a box because that's, that, that is what I do. Um, and it's kind of maybe the most friendly way of thinking about it, or like maybe one of the simplest ways of thinking about it. Um, because the box that I'm just, that I'm talking about is it lives in my computer. Uh, I don't work with actual real galaxies that are really out there, or at least not yet, like not at, at this stage in um, the code that I'm writing. I Eventually I want to, but I'll talk about that later. For now, um, all the galaxies that I work with are just, they're kind of made up, they're simulated and, and they live in my computer. And so this probably raises maybe like two questions, right? Like one is, what is it that I wanna know about those galaxies? And two, why can't I use real ones? Like, what is it about these galaxies in a box, it's so useful to me. So the first question, um, what do I wanna know about them? That one is kind of complicated. Um, so it requires me to kind of go back a little bit and talk about something that I think is really cool and that's dark matter. So there is normal matter that we can see that like you and I are made up of, that's like protons and neutrons and electrons and all that stuff. And you know, we deal with that every day. I mean, it's in like the coffee that I'm drinking or like a sandwich that you would eat, all of that stuff. And, and we can see it, like it interacts with light. We know that it's there because we can look at it, we can see it. Dark matter, it's called dark because we can't see it. It doesn't interact with light in the ways that we know uh, normal matter too. But we figure that it's there because of gravity. Like, we, like funny things happen where we see um, galaxies rotating faster than we'd expect them to or we see light bending as if it's trying to get around something super, super massive, but we don't see with like with light anything that's that massive. And so that's what kind of clues us in that there's something else there that we can't see. And that's what we've termed dark matter. And so the following question is then, how is dark matter arranged? Like, where is it? Like, how is it structured in the universe? And so to answer that question, you can actually use a little bit of math, which is, what we do like 90% of the time, we're either doing math or coding, I would say, mostly coding. I don't actually do that much math. Um, but essentially you can use a little bit of math to, to model, okay, what happens if you make the universe expand? Because if you go all the way back to the beginning, it was like nothing and then something and then, right? And so you can model what happens if you make the universe expand, what happens to like a, a little 
tiny spot that's like a little bit more dense in the surrounding spots. As time goes on, the universe expands. What happens to that tiny spot? Well, what happens is it grows to a bigger spot. It gets more and more dense and more and more massive. And eventually you get this big clump of dark matter that for some reason they decided to call it dark matter halo. I don't know why, because I feel like halo implies a shape, like a very particular shape. And the truth is we don't know what the shape is. We can't see it, but halo is a term they decided on. So it's a dark matter halo. But just think of it as this big clump of dark matter, just this big structure that has managed to find stability and, and, and now it's there. And so it, th that big clump of dark matter is gonna kind of direct normal matter and tell it where to go. Because as I mentioned earlier, we can't see the dark matter, but we know that gravitationally it does interact and so normal matter is going to coalesce wherever the dark matter does it's going to kind of map out where the normal matter is going to concentrate and so where you got a bunch of normal matter you can get stars and galaxies and, and all the normal things that we like to look at and so that's actually what i'm interested in is i want to know about how galaxies are like arranged and distributed in these big clumps of dark matter and we don't know a whole lot about that. It's a very, very open, as you can probably imagine, since we can't see dark matter, it's a very, very open question. And we're always wanting to know more about it. So that's my research area. And in astronomy, that's, we, it's a kind of a vague name, but we call it large scale structure, which sounds ridiculous because like, what, what do we do that isn't large scale structure? But that's, that's kind of the name for it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I do a, a little bit more specifically. That's awesome. Uh, so we have lots of questions already all about space. So let's get into it. Shout out to Mrs. Specta, Mrs. Derek, and Miss Goldman's class. Uh, they're all hanging out. Um, and their class would like to know what needs to be in a galaxy? Like what, what are the, the parts that all make up a galaxy? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's actually, I think when people think about galaxies, they probably think a lot about just like stars, like big groups of stars, which Yes, that, I mean, in the simplest sense, a galaxy is a big group of stars. So you do need some stars. Um, but there's some other components too that are a little bit dependent on the type of galaxy you're looking at because there's actually, there's a few different types. But one thing that you might see when looking at a galaxy is actually dust, like literally dust. Like when you dust something off, just like dust, like little particles, right? Um, there's dust out there in space, little tiny particles. Um, and when we're looking at galaxies and taking pictures of galaxies, you can totally see, um, depending on the type of galaxy, these like big wide, we call them dust lanes, because they're kind of like big like arms of dust. And you can totally see them obscuring the light and, and literally it's dust. And there's astronomers out there who devote their entire careers to literally studying dust, which I guess on earth would sound really boring, but it's actually really cool because it's like space dust, which is so awesome. So galaxies have dust, um, or a lot of them do. And uh, well, for our Milky Way, um, it's a spiral. And so it's got that really, really pretty design and that has a structure to it. So we've, it's got arms. And then in the center, it's got what's called a bulge. And so I guess that's also a component of galaxies is structure. Um, so the spirals are one type. There's another type that's called elliptical. And that just means that it doesn't have that spiral structure. It's not really got the arms, but it does. It's, it's just kind of like one big fuzzy like bulge. Uh, so that's a different structure. And you would find more stars. Um, you know, there could be more dust. And the different types will have different amounts of dust, different types of stars, different ages of stars. Maybe they're forming new stars actively maybe they've stopped doing that because they're like old and tired uh but they're they're all different uh but i would say kind of the main components are things like dust stars um and you know planets there's exoplanets um stars have planets around them so those are out there so yeah those are some of the things that go into the galaxy big big group of stars with like featuring other things awesome. gas clouds lots of stuff Cool, awesome. Um, Nathan asks, can planets grow or do they always stay the same size? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I'm not like a super big planet guy, but from what I can tell, I mean, planets had to grow to get to where they are now. Um, like, I guess, so like I said, I'm not a big planet guy, but I, I do know a, 
tiny bit about like some, some of the theories on planets. So essentially, from, from what I gather, it seems like the way that these kind of solar systems would form is you would have a, a star or at least one like central star. And then the star system evolves out of the surrounding material. Uh, because like the, the star is like this, it forms from a gas cloud. A, a star is essentially like a big ball of hot, like burning gas. And so it forms out of this big gas cloud and then condenses to what's gonna be like the sun or something, for example. But it's a really messy process and there's all this stuff that's around in, in a disc. And uh, they, they call that a kind of a, a big word, fancy word, protoplanetary disc. That's just proto, you know, before planetary planet disc. So before planet disc, protoplanetary disc. Um, and it's just a big old disk of stuff that uh, closer. So one of the theories is that closer to the star where it's hotter, you get like the rockier planets further out past uh, the like the, the snow line where it would be icier. You would get the sort of gas giants. That's what our solar system looks like. So that kind of makes sense to us. But we learn more about exoplanets all the time. We find weird ones. Um, so that's also a very open area. Um, so as far as planets growing, they, I, I think they kind of have to, to get to their, their current stage because where they are, how big they are, what they look like when they're formed, and then like how big they are, what they look like now, for example, there, there's a lot of evolution in, in between those stages, I'm pretty sure. So um, it, they can, you can have plant, you can have like asteroids or whatever collide and maybe you get new rings. So there, there is active change and growth happening um, i don't think that they really have to stay the same at all but you do need a kind of i guess like a dramatic process to add mass or something right cool that's awesome um zachary wants to know about how many galaxies do we know of that's a really good question that i do not know the answer to but i know it's a lot i know it's a whole lot um a whole lot because <laughs> i feel like Every time I look at like pretty space pictures, there's the galaxies that we all know that the pictures like come up time and time again because they're aesthetically very nice and everyone uses them as their screen saver. Yeah. So you've got like Andromeda Galaxy and Whirlpool Galaxy. If you've never seen those, they're gorgeous. And I totally recommend like a Google search because they're beautiful. But when you, the deeper you get into astronomy, like people study these very particular galaxies for very particular reasons, because uh -huh. there's features that they really like, or there's like a particular type of element that is abundant in them that they really want to study. And people get really specific with why they choose certain galaxies to look at. And so they're always just like, I study this one, I study this one, I study that one. And there's like, just galaxies that I've never seen before, heard of before. I, I didn't know they existed. And so there's, there's so many, there's literally so many. And we've got catalogs, like catalogs on catalogs. Right. Yeah, yeah, we've got catalogs full of them, like multiple catalogs full of them. Um, and maybe if you've ever Googled or seen like an image of a galaxy, you saw it listed like M followed by a number. Um, that's just like a catalog. So M is from Messier, and that that was a, a person, and that's one that's a catalog, and we got like tons of those. So, I mean, we know a lot, a whole lot. Awesome, hard to even like imagine. Um, Thomas, age seven, would like to know: uh, Do you think personally that there are any other life forms involved in these exoplanets? So I don't see, my answer to this is I, I don't see why not, you know, um, like we are here and there's not, I mean, that it's incredible that we're here. That's not most likely, but it's happened. So I feel like I, I could never rule it out. I just feel like I could never have the type of evidence to rule out the existence of extraterrestrials. It's such a big universe. I don't know what's out there. That's always my answer. Is, yeah. Is it like, I feel like I could just, I'm never confident enough to actually know. Right. Ever. A great question. 
Awesome. Um, that uh, trifecta of classrooms has another question. How does space feel? Have you ever been to space? And if you had the opportunity, would you go? I've never been to space and I, I feel like I'm so terrified. I would never go to space. space. I love looking at it, thinking about it from here, but it's so huge and powerful and unknown. And I would just like to observe it. I would just love to keep observing it from right here. Um, how does it feel? Uh, well, I can, all I could really, I've never been, but all I could really tell you is that the whole grab, gravity thing um, on earth, we're really used to just, you step outside and you're on the ground because you've got like this really big, massive planet to keep you on the ground. And in space, that wouldn't be true. You, you, you felt, you see astronauts like floating around the shuttle. Um, so that's, that's how space feels in that sense. You, you, the gravity's um, light there isn't the same gravity. Um, other than that, I have no idea how space feels. I kind of want to know. I'm very happy just looking at it. <laughs> I would never, never go to space. Oh my God. Too scary. I want to be around other people and Perfect. animals and plants. It's just too, too scary for me. Um, even the deep sea, I'm not sure. And I love squid and the ocean and I'm just not so sure. Still a little, I just like sea level is a good place for me. So much down there. Oh yeah. my goodness. Whew. Uh, next question from Sasha. Secret. So much. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, Sasha. Sasha asks, do astronomers kind of name something before they actually even know what it is? Name something before they actually interesting to name something before we know what it is what do you think um because like maybe you'll see a big black so spot and you're like let's call it a black hole is it a hole i don't know but we'll call it a black hole mm, i see i see um i feel like not that i don't think that i think it'd be really bad practice to call it something like definitively if you don't know that it is that, like, especially for like a black hole or something, you people publish papers like we found this thing, and it might be this, but they're always very, hopefully forthcoming about how you know, we don't actually know, and hopefully they give you some sense of how confident we are, or they are. Um, so I I don't think it'd be very difficult something, and also as far as names, names for things tend to be very boring in astronomy. Um, like, there'll, there'll be like a fun name that we call something, but like the catalog name tends to be something like, you know, M31 or like NGC, like, like those are like galaxy names. So they tend to be just sort of like letters and numbers for things. Um, but no, I don't think that it would ever really be good practice to just call something what you think it is before you have sort of sense of what it is. That would probably, people wouldn't like that, I don't think. Fair, very fair. Um, all right, the next question's from Maureen. I heard that the Milky Way and Andromeda Galaxy are going to collide. How fast are they moving? Right, uh, so this is true, uh, they are going to collide. I, I'm not sure what their speeds are. I could definitely find out. I, I feel like that is very, I could definitely find that out. Uh, uh, but they are, um, no time soon or anything. It's not something that we have to worry about. But actually on the topic of galaxy collisions, this is something that I, I find pretty interesting. Maybe when people imagine the word collide, I think maybe they think of something that's very aggressive and, and powerful and scary and like things smashing up against each other. Well, the truth is, for galaxies, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of stars in them, but there's also a lot of empty space, like in between the stars. Because think of it this way, right? We have a star, our star, the sun, but how far away are all the other ones? When you look up at the night sky, like they're way out, out there, and so there's a lot of empty space in between. 
Um, and so a collision of galaxies doesn't really mean things bumping up against each other at all. It's actually extremely unlikely that two stars would literally collide. It's pretty much going to be two. It's just doing this, like passing through like this. And so the result, if there were to be people or something, you know, what happens, what they would see in the night sky, it's just like, it'd just be brighter. There's like a bunch more stars. It wouldn't be some horrific, violent process like collision usually implies. That, so that surprised me when I, when I learned it. And so I thought I would pass it along. That's excellent news because that's one less thing that I have to worry about. So anytime there's a, a science thing I no longer have to yes. be having nightmares about, love it. Okay, one less thing to feel anxious about. Um, okay, cool. So, one less thing to feel Okay, cool. Uh, how, okay, here we go, from Elliot. What program do you use to simulate the galaxies? Oh, yes. Um, all, pretty much everything I ever do is in Python. Um, it's, it's so great for everything that I want to do. It's, it's pretty quick to pick up, to learn. Um, nothing, I don't think anything that I do is that complicated as far as a computer, it's going to be a long time to run. Um, some of the simulations that astronomers do are very intense and do take a very long time to run, considering a whole lot of information, but nothing that I do is really that complicated as far as like waiting just days and days and days and days for so I, I use Python for everything um I love it it's my friend yeah awesome um so Lay wants to know uh how do planets and stars get their color wants to know uh how do planets and stars get their color oh interesting um so that's that's step two things for planets like I mentioned I'm not a huge planet sky, but I have to imagine like composition. So what's in them um, is a big part of why they are, what color they are. I mean, even thinking about Earth, like you see the picture of the blue marble, all the blue, that's just water. Um, it, it's blue, or the, yeah, I guess that's water. And then, this, I mean, light scatter, scattering based on what color it is, is what makes the sky look blue. So I guess it's a combination of what's actually in in the planet and then how light interacts with it. I guess we're talking about the planets. For stars, um, color is actually really important and really cool um, in stars because it tells us how hot the star is because we actually have a really, really nice scheme for talking about the temperature of stars and relating the temperature of the star to the color of the star. And when I say color, what I really mean is what uh, type of light is most emitted by that star. And, and that is dependent on the temperature. And so really, really, really hot stars emit uh, mostly in like the blue light region, like they're really hot and the light is very blue really, really cool stars emit more like in the red region, which is maybe a bit the opposite of what people tend to think blue is cold, it's hot, but in reality, um, the, the blue light is really, really, really energetic, and that's what the hottest stars are emitting. So in stars, color is an indicator of temperature, which is really, really, really cool and super useful. It tells us a lot about stars, about galaxies, um, and yeah, I, one of my one of my favorite things about stars is how much we can learn about them just by looking at the light that comes out. That's super cool. So so there's been a lot of talk about this one star Betelgeuse, right? And it's kind of like reddish looking. And so do we know that it's kind of getting like low energy and ready to explode because of the color? So there definitely is a link between like where a star is in its life cycle 
and then things like its size and its color. And it depends on a few things. So the main part of a star's life that it, you know, the part that it lives through for the, like the middle age, when it's middle aged, um, is the, it's the main sequence. And so when we talk about stars' lives, we talk about them as sort of like before the main sequence, on the main sequence, and then, and then after. And so depending on how big and how hot the star was when it was in the main sequence, that main part of its life, kind of de that determines the trajectory once it's in the final stages of its life cycle, right. evolving off the main sequence. And so if you, if you know something about how the star was, so like take our sun, for example, right now it's living out the main sequence, the main part of its life. Um, and so we know it's, it emits, it looks yellow to us, but it, it, it actually takes in, in green. Um, and so we know how, you know, the temperature and the color that it's at. And so we know what it's going to look like as it, whenever it starts to evolve off the main sequence and go into the last, you know, like, and, we, and we can look at that to think like, like it's going to get really big and it's going to get colder and then it's going to get red. So yes, like you can absolutely link the color to like where it's at in the life cycle if you know what it was like on the main sequence. And so, and so you can definitely make conclusions like, okay, we're looking at it and it's looking like it's doing things like turning red or maybe it's pulsating or moving to the end of its life cycle. So you can tell that, but you won't know when. That's the thing. Right. You won't get to say it's gonna explode or something in like a week. You can't know when. And, the, and maybe the coolest thing is that even if we saw it go boom, the light, takes so long to get here. That means it actually happened a very long time ago, but we're just seeing it. If, it, if we were to see it, we would just see it now. Right. That's one of the weirder things. Space, sometimes when I think about space, like I just feel like my brain can't handle it. It's like too, too crazy. Um, and that's one of those, like, like the amount of time it takes moving back in time, like, wow. Too weird, too spooky. Uh, Jaden would like to know what is the weirdest thing in space in your opinion? Like, no, what is the weirdest thing in space? Um, there's a lot of weird things. There's a lot of weird things out there. Um, okay, maybe. Okay, yeah. So. There are stars that they're really like big. Mm -hmm. I'll give a sample. Um, there are neutron stars. So I just I just talked about how we can determine where a star, what's going to happen to a star, like as it's dying, based on kind of how it was on the main sequence. So one type of post, like, we say stellar remnant, like uh, after the star has died or like stopped living out the main sequence, um, what's left, we call it a remnant. And so there's one type of stellar remnant that's a neutron star. And so it's literally just like a really dense packed clump of neutrons. Um, and like it's really hot. And some of them,
Okay, so you were breaking up for a fair par- part of that. So I'm going to see if we got it. You said we can tell time using dead stars that are called pulsars because they pulse light at you. Yes, and so they spin and they pulse. Yes. Wild. Okay, super cool. Um, let's see. So Elliot, by the way, just has uh, something he'd like to say. Magnetars are are Elliot's favorite kind. Um, and yeah, Sasha, we know the video is lagging a lot. Oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> very cool um so let's see um Jaden would like to know how do you feel when you speak and teach about this and learn about astronomy like how does doing science make you feel that's a good question um I guess mostly just I feel happy when other people are obviously very interested and I can I feel very happy when I can actually address the question and do some things that they don't know. And so I think I am excited to share things like that. I think that's a really good feeling when I feel things like that. Oh man, the internet is not being our friend today. try that yeah that might be great and then we only have like two questions to wrap up um but yeah if you can let me know um when you get there and i'll make sure to bump you up to a panelist There you are. Yeah. All right. Do you want to talk and see how that goes? Okay. I had to get out as my other self because I was echoing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we can hear you a lot better with your phone, that's for sure. So definitely leave the computer. Cool. Yeah, we're making quite a spooky echo situation. Okay, there we go. Excellent. Okay, so um, can you answer one more time how you feel about when you're doing science? And then we'll have our last two questions. Yeah. Oh, also, could you screen share a video? Oh, yes, yes, yes. You should, you should be a co-host now. Yeah, uh, okay. wonderful. All right, um, so how it makes me feel. Yeah, so I was saying that I think my main feeling is that I feel excited when the people I'm talking to are excited. And so I feel happy when I can actually address the questions. And I think I feel particularly happy when I can teach them something that they didn't know before. Um, because well, astronomy is amazing because People, like kids show up to like planetarium shows and things and they just know so much because I've read so much. And I think that that's amazing. But also it means I kind of feel kind of silly because I'm like, what, what can I tell you? You know everything. Right. And so I feel really excited when I can actually give them new information that they didn't know. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't reach a little bit too far because obviously I, there's a lot of, complex math and things like that, but they don't want to know those things. And right. that's not that's not what I want to talk about. Right. I, I want to give them really cool science stuff that they might not know. And so when I'm able to do that, I, I really do love that feeling. And one of my favorite things, if not my actual favorite thing about doing this type of work is talking about it. Because I just, I don't think that it's very useful to do it at all if you're not going to be able to share it. Agreed, completely agreed. Awesome. Yeah, I love uh, sharing. So I have uh, my car is a squid mobile and the back window says like, if you want a squid fact, text this number for a squid facts. And people will text that number who 
are not interested in squid, don't know much about squid. And the, <laughs> and that's the best. Because the, the first fact is that uh, squid have beaks for mouths. And some people oh. react like, yeah, duh. And other people are like, what? Like that's yes, wild. Exactly. And that is the reaction that just like brings me so much joy. Like, yeah, we got one. Like that's that. Exactly. Yeah, totally agree. Um, so we like to wrap up every session by asking everybody the same two questions. The first okay. question is, uh, let's say that you have everybody's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise. What would it be? Oh, wow. Um, okay. Everybody's attention. Um, I think maybe the thing that I would say about astronomy is if I had everybody's attention, I'd really want them to know. I don't think it would be like any kind of space fact or anything like that. I would really want them to know that space in general is like something that as inhabitants of like earth we are able to look at and study and enjoy but two things one is that we don't own it like it's not ours it's it's there and we wouldn't be here if not for the makeup of what's out there which is amazing but it's not ours but then two is that it's something that we're all responsible for or like maintaining it is something that we is a, is a duty that we all share mm -hmm. it's not one person's job one person shouldn't take it upon themselves it's something that we all share right. um, and the night and the night sky is something that i think we all have have a right to um, right because it's, it's a beautiful thing and no one person should get to you know do stuff with it <laughs> ruin it for anybody else yes right. um like, that, like that's elon musk say. and those little satellites that like are showing up in everybody's that's exactly that's exactly it that's exactly it i just it's not what any one person's job to make significant alterations to, right. to what's out there um that's what i would say is that, is that feel feel gratitude feel uh responsibility feel the, the weight and the significance of space um, but don't feel ownership that's great advice yeah when i think about um so for those of you who don't know like elon and i'm not 100 percent sure on this so Keyshawn, you might have more information but elon musk is trying to get like uh and i think other folks are trying to get like a worldwide internet situation and he's putting out these like little light i, I don't know what they are some kind of satellite that will Early. Starlight is what it's called. Starlink. 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 And like when people are taking pictures of the night sky with like these really long exposures that you need of the camera to like get all that light collected so you can get a pretty picture, you just see these like little dots all over the place. And streaking. Yeah. Like streaking exactly. across. So we can't even get a pretty picture of space anymore from Earth because they're putting all these satellite things up. And that just like it, uh, it makes me upset. Makes me upset. Of course, there's there's the people who say like, oh, it's it's not like you're exaggerating like the effects. Like we can still do tons of good astronomy, which yeah, yeah, we can. But I mean, you spend more and you spend more and you spend more. And, you know, at some point, yeah. we got to think about what we're putting in our little orbit area. Um, right. So the next question is, you still have everybody's attention in the whole world and you can ask, you can tell them one thing about anything. It can be as big picture important or like, I think Godzilla is better than King Kong. Like it can be anything, uh, whatever you want. Um, it, this is your, your time. Oh man. Um, okay. Um, I, I have to go, I have to go serious. I feel like if you know me, you know that if I really had everyone's attention, I have to say something very serious. Um, I would say to, I would remind everyone that there is enough food to feed everyone. We have enough. It is not a supply problem. It is in, it's a distribution problem. Uh, it's, it's an inequitable distribution problem. And I would remind everybody the food is here, but the people aren't getting it. Um, I think that's good to remember because it means that we have a
yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, that's great. I, I've just, so I'm, I, I'm trying to read more books and less Twitter this year. That's like my goal for the year, like read <laughs> on things. And um, I just read this book called The Divide, which is basically about what it sounds like, like the differences in people's experiences uh, in life and uh, like everything from policing to welfare. There was a, an in-depth explanation of like how messed up our welfare system is. Um, yes. I know this is not science class, we're, we're going into social studies class right now, but yeah. my God, like the fact that we were able to get um, these stimulus checks to everybody, just like, how much do you make? Okay, you get a stimulus, stimulus check, but the hoops people have to jump through for welfare is yeah. it's like, oh, it's yeah. me up at night. So, so that, and yeah, and then I'm also now reading Hope Yarin's new book, which I don't remember the name of, but she's the author of Lab Girl and I'm reading her new book that's all about climate change. And I just read the chapter about yeah, food distribution. And we've made so many amazing leaps and bounds on growing food. And it's just not getting to where it needs to go. Ugh. And, and here's the thing, right? People, people would say like, oh, we're having astronomy chat. And then this feels like a very disparate thing. But that's exactly it, right? Like, we live in the world, like people who do science live here. Yeah. And so it's, it's never, it's never like irrelevant or off topic or a completely separate thing to talk about right. social issues, because like we are social creatures, like we literally live in this world, we're part of society, and we don't get to just divorce ourselves from it to, right. to do our fun science stuff. It just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. I completely agree. I completely agree. Yep. And if we're trying to solve the world's problems with science, we got to pay attention to all the problems. We can't just pay exactly. attention to our little like narrow area of expertise. Yeah, like I studied squid, but I'm still paying attention to everything. So amazing, cosine so hard. Thank you so much for joining us today. Do you have anything else? Oh, where can we find you on social media? And is there anything that you'd like to plug before we wrap up? So my most used social media by far is Twitter, for better or worse. Um, I'm at Keyshawn Rants, because um, that's mostly, that's what I do, um, is rant. And so that's, my Twitter. Um, I do have a YouTube channel that I post random things like, um, you know, I sing, I'll do like songs or uh, I like to make cocktails. So there's some videos of that. It's in my bio on my, on my Twitter. It's just my name, Keyshawn Ivory. Um, so bug, I guess, I guess that's bugging on YouTube. Yeah, I'll plug that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, definitely follow Keyshawn on Twitter, Keyshawn Rants. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining us. The next session that we will be having at Skype a Scientist will be, I believe, next week. Uh, yes, next week. We're going to be talking about the intersections of science and art with uh, Liz Kosick, uh, or Kosick. She is cool as heck, does all these beautiful plant um, illustrations, and like it's, it's going to be good. So join us for that on the 7th at 1.00. Um, we will, we will see you then. And thank you again, Keyshawn, for joining us. Of course, of course. And thank you to the construction people for like <laughs> yeah. ruining my stretchy pictures. <laughs> I, I understand completely. All right. We'll see ya. Bye everyone. Bye.